This video is going to be an introduction to expectation. Uh, expectation is also known as expected value in other, you know, different people say different words for the same idea. So uh, I'm going to invariably switch between the two and try my best to keep to expectation, but I can't guarantee that I will stay consistent or it's going to be the same as uh, across our two books. So we'll start this video out with an informal description of expectation, and then we'll immediately jump into some specific, uh, specific examples. None of the examples will be as specific as you want them to be, but this video is serving two roles for us. One, it's helping us get accustomed to this idea of expectation by showing us like a first look of two, a bunch of topics we're going to see in this class later on this semester. So you can basically think of these six specific examples as like subsections of the future of this course. So not only is this a first look at expectation, it's like a sneak peek of what we have in store for us this semester. So six examples is quite a bit. Let's get started. Whoops. Expectation is like a generalized area under the function operation. It's like a generalized integral. And I say generalized because we say for the density function, f from some sample space to the non-negative real numbers, if s is countable, and that includes finite, so I'm just putting this in as a reminder. If S is countable, then the expected value takes a sum, okay? If S is uncountable, then expected value takes an integral. And that's what I mean by generalized. This expectation operator really depends on the size of the sample space, the size of the domain of the density function, f. OK, so let's just say a few more things about this operation expectation based on the words we just had. If S is countable, then the expectation of some arbitrary function G is equal to the sum of X in S, G of X times F of X where f is the density function of interest, and g is this arbitrary function that we have yet to define. So it's almost like the expectation operator is more general than you want it to be. Not only does it differentiate between sums and integrals, it also applies to an arbitrary function. So let me just write out what this operation looks like in the case that S is uncountable. But you'll see it pretty much follows a pattern that now if the sample space is uncountable, then the expectation operator is an integral over the set S. 
And we take that arbitrary function g and multiply it by the density function. So what we're going to explore in the rest of this video is the six properties, I mean six specific examples each define a different function g for each function g we have a new feature of the distribution of interest. Okay, so here we go. This expectation operator is super general. It applies to some function with respect to the density function of interest. If the density function of interest is defined on a countable or finite set, then the expectation operator applied to G sums the product of G and F for all the elements X in the set S. If, on the other hand, the sample space S is an uncountable set, then the expectation operator applied to a an arbitrary function g takes the integral of the product of this function g and the density function f. So we're going to look at six specific examples in this video, and each example is going to define a different function g. For each function g, we're going to then have new features of the distribution of interest, and the distribution is from which the density function comes. Okay, that's all very general and abstract. That's why these specific examples are supposed to help. So let's set up some notation for all the examples that follow. Let f be the density function of distribution named capital F. That is, I don't care what the distribution is named. such that F takes you from the sample space to the positive, non-negative real numbers. So our first example is going to be probability. Whatever crazy ideas you have had about probability, it turns out that probability is defined on sets. So we're going to let A be a subset of the sample space. Now, the world of statistics then calculates the probability of the set A. That's not going to make total sense to us right now, but don't worry. Next week, we'll start into probability. And we will get a better understanding of why probability acts on sets. And there is the LaTeX code for this, what's supposed to be a capital bold P, kind of like we have capital bold E that looks like this. It turns out probability is just the expectation of an indicator function. The indicator function is only one anytime an argument of the function is in the set A and zero otherwise. So drawn as a picture, all of my pictures are basically going to reference um, uh, density functions on uncountable spaces. We call those continuous density, uh, continuous distributions. And all of my uh, pictures are going to reference distributions on uncountable sample spaces because they're easier for me to draw. So probability is area under a function for some set A. 
Now, because probability is bounded above by one and zero, we're essentially just taking subsets of the sample space, but that's exactly what we are sp stating. So we're learning that probability is area under density functions. Whatever crazy ideas you have had about uh, probability, if it doesn't fit this idea that probability is area under density functions, then we need to refine your definition of probability. But I'm sure much of what you think about probability is probably accurate, like you probably already knew something like this. And that holds in our new framework. OK, so there's our first example. Probability is relative to the arbitrary functions, indicator functions, on subsets of the sample space. Probability corresponds to expectation of indicator functions. OK, let's give another example. So we're going to keep all that same notation from before. And now we're going to introduce percentile. Say you are in the 75th percentile of U.S. adult heights. We'd say your height is some value. And we denote that value p subscript 75. You could write that out as p underscore curly brace 75 curly brace. That would be the LaTeX to get a subscript with multiple characters. We would say your height is p 75. OK, so that might look like this picture. So here is a density function describing US adult heights. And P75 is somewhere down here. I don't know, maybe it's like five foot. Gosh, if I had to guess, it might be something like five foot 10. I don't know, that's just a guess. And what we're saying is 75% of adults are less than your height. That's what it means to be in the 75th percentile. 75% of adults are less than this height. That's what it means to be in the 75th percentile. It turns out this number, you'll notice it already corresponds to area under the curve, is just an expectation, is found through an expectation. Specifically, whoops. Let me start over, sorry about that. 0 0.75 is equal to the expectation on the indicator variable of negative infinity up to P75. So this notation might not be as easy for us to see, which is why I drew the picture first. We're essentially going to integrate from the lower bound of the sample space, whatever it might be. I'm just going to use negative infinity as the default. We're going to integrate from the lower bound of the sample space up to some value, P75, such that the area under the curve is equal to 0.75. We could write that out like this. 0 0.75 is equal to the integral of the density function times, oh, for you all, I wrote it in the other direction. Doesn't matter. We could write that out as an integral by saying it's the integral on the set negative infinity up to p75 times f of x dx, and we want that equal to 0.75. But this notation here is really just saying calculate the integral from negative infinity up to p75. 
of f of x dx. It's saying that because the indicator function is only 1 or 0. If it's 1, then 1 times f of x is f of x. And if it's 0, then the integral doesn't contribute anything. So really, all we're doing is integrating from negative infinity to p75, where we have 1 times f of x. You need to solve this equation for p75. And that is how you get percentiles in the world of statistics. OK, our next example is the mean. In words, the mean is the central location for which data might show up. Data will show up. So if we had a distribution that looked like this, then this will be the mean. I'm going to try to draw a little, now nah, let's just draw regular M. We're going to draw an M. This might be the mean for a distribution that has a density function that looks like this. Notice most of the data will show up right around this value. OK. We need some new notation. We're going to use the function ID, which stands for identity, to be the function that takes in some value x and returns that value x. Then m is equal to the expected value of this function. This is quite unhelpful. I totally understand. That's why I drew the picture. Hopefully, the picture makes the central location for which data might appear uh, more obvious. Don't worry. We're going to spend much more time on this idea as the course progresses after probability and percentiles, of course. OK, our next one is variance. The variance describes how far data are away from the mean on average and in squared distance. So I'm not going to write out what the expectation operator looks like for this one, because it's a little intimidating. Instead, I'm going to draw you two pictures. So we should think of the variance being a measure away from the mean. So relative to that density function we have on the left, here is a density function that has the same mean, but I hope you can see that it's much a much narrower density function. Let's try to draw that line a little bit better. And the same idea, the variance measures distance from the mean on average in squared distance. So here we have a relatively small variance because the data do not often show up far away from the mean. And here we have a relatively large variance. But there isn't really great meaning to variance outside of comparing one density function to another, outside of comparing one distribution to another. So far, we have a mean, which describes the centrality, the central location of data. And we have variance, which describes how far away from that central location data are. Those turn out to be the most common descriptions of distributions. And it turns out they are both calculations of expectation. OK, we got two more examples to give. The cumulative distribution function.
And again, I'm going to start with a picture. I'm getting better at this, drawing these density functions on my computer. The density function is a function, we often call it capital F, named after the distribution of interest, whose argument is this uh, value along the x-axis, and it defines area up until that point. So what you should do is imagine the argument of this function being dragged along the x-axis. It can vary along the values of the x-axis. And so what we're doing here is defining expectation relative to an indicator function where the argument to the function x is the upper bound to the indicator function's set, the interval for which the indicator function indicates. The argument to this function, f, is the upper bound to the interval of the indicator function. You should imagine this value x being dragged along the x-axis, but I can't draw that out for you very well. So uh, I'm not going to say too much about why the cumulative distribution function is incredibly important for us in the world of statistics. I'm just going to let you trust that I wouldn't be introducing you to topics that are not important. And eventually in this class, we will see the importance of cumulative distribution functions. OK, I've saved the trickiest for the last moment generating functions. Um, I'm just going to define it right off the bat. It is a new function, capital M, of the argument T. For you engineers, you've probably seen something like this before, though it might not look immediately obvious like this. T is the argument to the function, and ID is the identity function that we have seen before. You all are generally not used to having functions written out without arguments, but this is proper notation. It is T times the function that returns its argument. Um, the fancy thing about these moment generating functions is when you take their derivative, that's what this prime is going to be, when you take the first derivative and evaluate it at zero, what you get is the mean m. And when you do something a little bit fancier, like take the second derivative, evaluate it at zero, and subtract off the first derivative, evaluate it at zero, and squared, you get the variance. So moment generating functions are actually not that important because of properties like this. It turns out they have properties like this. But it turns out the moment generating function is important because it helps us justify why the normal distribution is the most common in the world of statistics. And that's going to be a whole week for us in this class. So this video was really just here to give us a preview of what's to come later on in the semester. Some of the notation in the world of statistics is the hardest part to grapple with. So I'm hoping, even if this was a quick and informal and incomplete introduction, this will at least just get us to the idea that what we are essentially doing is working with area under functions. That's an incredibly new way to think about functions. We're not always interested in the function itself. We are interested in um, properties defined by area under these functions.